to go back to the planetary health, it's very clear that what we eat and our food choices have a, a major impact on greenhouse gas production and other environmental variables as well. But of all of these, the greenhouse gas issue is mo the most serious. And because it can, because we're going into vicious circles, it become irreversible. And uh, among, if we look at greenhouse gas production, uh, the, uh, these uh, different color bars are looking at per serving or per calorie or per, per weight. Uh, no matter how you look at it, uh, beef intake is by far, along with lamb intake, by far the biggest source uh, of greenhouse gas. Uh, and over on the right are plant-based uh, protein sources. Uh, and they have a very low greenhouse gas. Now, it looks like over on the right you see dairy there in the red. But that's because they, this analysis in the red there used per weight which dairy is, uh, milk is 90% water. So that's, if you look at it per calorie or per, uh, uh, or per gram of protein, uh, dairy looks like cheese, which is over toward the left there. Not as bad as beef, but close to it. So uh, looking at, uh, a lot of the literature looks at foods by weight. And when you put dairy into it and then look at milk, of course, you get a very misleading kind of answer where nuts are almost zero water in them. So uh, uh, looking at something that's 90% water compared to nuts and dry beans uh, doesn't make sense at all. But the, the bottom line is that uh, legumes, soy, uh, nuts have uh, about somewhere, depending on the analysis, 1 20th of the greenhouse gas production uh, compared to, to beef. And uh, legumes are uh, very similar. So it, it matters a lot. And I'll come back to that. Uh, the quality of grains also is, and the quality of carbohydrate overall is extremely important. This is a slide thanks to General Mills. And this is what they do. They take healthy whole grains. And if they grind them up uh, and turn them into flour, we have whole wheat flour, whole oat flour. Uh, it's whole wheat, but ground up into fine particles. Uh, but most of the wheat and grains in the food are, that are fed to humans are refined grains. And that means they've taken off the bran on the outside which is where most of the vitamins and minerals reside. And then they chip out the germ. And that's the embryonic plant. And that germ is coated in oil, healthy oils, to protect it from oxidation. So it can sprout a year or two later under the right conditions. And so all the, the lipid-soluble vitamins are there in the germ. Um, and then you're left with the endosperm, which is mostly just starch. And then you, they grind that up and create flour, which we make into Wonder Bread and bagels and things like that. Uh, and uh, then there's all this German uh, and bran left. Uh, what do they do with that? Of course they don't throw it away. Uh, that, that's where all the nutrition is. So they feed that, we feed that to animals. And they grow big and strong. And we eat the stuff over on the right, the refined flour. So what does that do to us? Uh, we've looked at this uh, in multiple ways. But uh, one way is creating glycemic load, which reflects the glycemic index of the food. Uh, like, and it's very high in rapidly absorbed carbohydrates like white flour and potatoes. And, and it also, the glycemic load takes into account the amount of, the, of that food that we're eating. And so the, this is looking at risk of type 2 diabetes in the nurse's health study. And uh, in the back, going from right to left, we have increasing glycemic load and going from back to front, we have increasing cereal fiber, from basically from whole grains. And so that combination of high glycemic load and low cereal fiber is related to about a 2 and a half fold increase in risk of type 2 diabetes compared to women who had the uh, low glycemic load and high cereal fiber intake. And uh, sadly, those women in that back corner were very often women who were doing what they were being told by the food guide pyramid, load up on Wonder Bread and bagels and that kind of stuff, My, and not even going down the road of all the junk food that's high in sugar. Uh, and so they were following those, what they thought were guide, uh, good guidelines, but ending up with higher risk of type 2 diabetes. Now, of course, uh, another major source of carbohydrates are sugar-sweetened beverages. And those are, if you had to pick one food that is most unhealthy, probably it's going to be sugar-sweetened beverages, because again, you can have huge amounts of sugar, 16, 17 teaspoons per 20 ounce serving with a standard beverage, Coke or uh, other, uh, other soda. 
And the average consumption among uh, younger American men, for example, or low income uh, uh, Americans is about three servings a day. So this is not just one serving, but three a day. And that, that's huge. So this is looking at risk for one serving a day in the Nurses' Health Study 2, about an 80% higher risk with one serving a day or more of uh, sugar-sweetened beverage. Uh, the orange bars are after we adjust for body mass index. So uh, that just means that part of this increase in risk is explained by the weight gain we get from drinking more sugar-sweetened beverages. <clears throat> so to summarize, for carbohydrates, uh, like dietary fat, carbohydrate quality rather than the, the percent of calories from carbohydrate appears to be important for health. And consuming grains in the form of high fiber whole grains will reduce risk of type 2 diabetes and coronary heart disease, but high intake of refined grains is likely to increase the risks of these diseases. And high intake of refined starch and sugar is particularly problematic with underlying insulin resistance. And I didn't actually go into that, but there are a lot of people who are predisposed to insulin resistance, either by being overweight or by having a genetic predisposition to a risk of type 2 diabetes. And actually, what we see is, uh, if we look around the world, a lot, of the pop a lot of the world's populations have a higher risk of type 2 diabetes uh, related to more predisposition to insulin resistance and are more susceptible to these bad diets. So every, the good news is everybody can have a low risk if we follow a healthy diet, even if you are predisposed, even for genetic reasons, to have a higher risk given a bad uh, traditional Western-type industrial diet. And reduction of soda and other sugary beverages is a high priority. Uh, a few words about milk and dairy. The uh, belief is in the rationale for recommendations, current recommendations of three servings a day is that it contains a lot of calcium and that's necessary to reduce fracture risk. But when we've looked at fracture risk as a function of milk consumption or overall dairy food consumption, this is what we see. It just really is flat. We don't see, uh, even with uh, uh, almost 30 servings of dairy a week, we don't see a reduction in risk of fractures. Uh, and if we look at total calcium intake, uh, we also don't see that high calcium intakes are critical for, important for reducing fracture risk. Uh, we definitely need some calcium, and we have a, we absolute, our bones are made of it. There's many important functions of calcium. We have to get some, but it looks like uh, we don't need to have this very high dairy consumption that's currently being recommended to have adequate calcium intake. Um, and there are some potential negatives of high dairy consumption, and there's a lot of evidence now that high dairy consumption is related to higher risk of uh, aggressive prostate cancer in men. This is a sli slide from many years ago from the Seventh-day Adventist study showing that men have, who had three servings a day of dairy had about a th almost a two-and-a-half-fold increase in risk of fatal prostate cancer, and we have data that supports this as well. So overall, the literature does support higher risk of prostate cancer especially uh, aggressive prostate cancer with higher uh, dairy consumption. Now, having said that, there's also some evidence that, uh, in fact, uh, strong evidence that dairy consumption does reduce colorectal cancer risk. And almost surely that, that is because of uh, the, the calcium that's there, because we can see that there is some reduction with, a, with uh, calcium supplements as well. Uh, so I think uh, if someone is having no dairy consumption, you might want to consider a, a modest uh, calcium supplement, uh, five or 600, it usually comes in 600 milligram units. Uh, but you don't need to take, you know, 1,000 or more milligrams of calcium supplements in, in general uh, from what we see for, uh, to get ad adequate calcium intake. Um, this is looking at Mediterranean, uh, looking at a Mediterranean diet in relation to uh, cognitive function. And uh, dementia, decline in cognitive function, is, I think, a, a concern on the minds of almost anybody who's sort of past midlife because we see our relatives who have been affected. And as physicians, we certainly see lots of people who we've who have been, who had healthy lives, and partly because we've helped people live 10 years longer than we, people were living back in the 1960s, uh, a large part of that through healthier lifestyles. Uh, and uh, uh, th this is certainly not a... A, a, a way any of us would want to uh, depart is spending years in a nursing home 
demented. Uh, and so in terms of absolute numbers, uh, the num uh, because of success in prolonging life, this is becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Although interestingly, if we look at age-adjusted data, in other words, if for a 70-year-old or an 80-year-old, the risk uh, now is quite a bit lower than it was uh, 30 or 40 years ago. But still, uh, what, the risk is way too high. So we'd like to find ways to reduce that risk, even if we can't prevent 100% of it, like we have done for heart disease. And it does, there's a lot of evidence now, this is what we see in our own data, uh, looking at nurses' health study and decline in cognitive function, uh, that there is a, a quite strong inverse relationship, lower risk of uh, cognitive problems with higher Mediterranean diet score. And when we've looked at the, dug down more deeply in the Mediterranean diet uh, pattern, uh, what's the most important factor, uh, probably multiple aspects contributing, but the most important factor does seem to be vegetable and fruit intake. So this is looking at just vegetable, higher vegetable intake alone. And now we're digging down looking at type of vegetables. That seems to make some difference as well. So I think uh, th this is an active area of research, but compared to what we had even five years ago, we, there's a lot of evidence now that uh, a healthy, uh, largely plant-based diet and uh, healthy plant-based diet, uh, terms have been used like whole food, healthy uh, plant-based diet, uh, it will have benefits for uh, maintaining good cognitive function later in life. 